strike has been so long. That felt good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want to welcome you all on behalf of Bridget and Colleen. I'm so excited I might get a little emotional. Um, into COVID, I got a really weird phone call from two really crazy ladies who said, we're doing this podcast. Do you want to be a guest? Oh, well, you know, I have nothing really to promote right now. Well, it's about women of a certain age. I'm in. <laughs> and uh, what was born was not just a wonderful interview, but a real true friendship from 3,000 miles away virtually. Can any of y'all relate to that during COVID? So... Uh, brainstorming, we talked about, boy, you know what you guys should do? We need to just all get together in person, not just the three of us, but a group of us all over, all the time. And so I'm so thrilled that you're here to see all their hard work come into fruition. So let's get this day started, Bridget and Colleen. Oh, this is down here. Nothing like starting off making me cry. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Conversations with Prime Women. Hi, my family. <laughs> so, as Mindy mentioned, we have a podcast called Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. My name is Colleen Rosenblum, and along with my dear friend Bridget Garrett, we host the podcast. And we started about four years ago when no one was talking about menopause. It, it's still even now. If you sit at a table and you mention a hot flash, women are like, oh, no, I'm too young. I'm not. No, no, no. Meanwhile, the sweat is running down their face, right? They're, like, trying to find a way to fan themselves, open the doors. They haven't slept in God knows how long. And, you know, there's symptoms of menopause that we don't talk about, but we need to. It needs to be a conversation that we accept because all of us are going through it. At some point in time, as Bridget likes to say, if you live long enough, you'll have the gift of menopause. So the podcast wasn't just about that. It was about everything to do with midlife. So whether you're changing careers, whether your relationships are changing, because sometimes empty nesting, you could look at your husband and be like, I can't wait to travel with him. And then you may look and say, mm, why? Why did I do that? <laughs> like, seriously? So, and that's okay. It's part of the conversation. So as we built this podcast, which we have to say is in the top one and a half podcasts in the world. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. We realized that this conversation needed to grow bigger. And so our friend Mindy who is like, we like to say, the wind beneath our wings, said, that's it. We're taking this on the road, and we are going to let women know that this conversation is important because it's not just about being lectured to. It's you want to sit in a room with a glass of wine or a mimosa. I hope everybody got their mimosas. And talk. And talk about what's happening to your life. And talk about things you can do to look forward to it. Because life is just getting started at 50. We are living longer. What do you want to do with it? So with that, I am going to give the mic over to Bridget, and we're going to get started on panel number one. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Colleen. And, okay, I have to have my notes because I am a little nervous up here. And it's all cool. Oh, was it not on? It's on. Okay. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous, so I just want to make sure I don't mess things up. And, and if I did, it's no big deal. No one's going to die about it. So where our first panel is boss ladies. And we have three really rock star boss ladies joining us on stage. So I'd like to introduce, or well, I'm going to have you, should they come on up first? Yeah. Yeah, bring up our boss ladies, and then I'll make, make our introductions. So. They come. And so we are so lucky to have three rock star boss lady CEOs on our couch all at the same time. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, so first I am going to introduce Pat Shea. She's right there. Yes, and y'all have microphones, and I think they're already turned on. Here you go. Oh, you got it? Everybody's got it. Yay. Okay, so 
Okay, so Pat Shea is a partner in Shea Advisory Services, and they provide services for profit and nonprofit organizations. And she has, uh, she's also the founder of Nashville Women's President's Organization. She's also served as the CEO of the YWCA in Nashville in Middle Tennessee for 11 years. Yes, so welcome, Pat. Thank you so much. And then we also have Mila Grigg, and I just have to share real quick, just a little personal story with Mila. So my husband was up for this promotion, and I always told him, there he is sitting back there looking really handsome, um, but I always told him, you wear your clothes too big, you wear them too big. So they sent Mila over with uh, Moda Branding and Imaging, and she went through our closet, <laughs> And he got a whole new wardrobe, and he got the job. So he got the promotion. So thank you. The Garrett family really wants to personally thank you for that. And we also have Lisa Creary here. And Lisa is the CEO of Sunita Skin Care. And you're going to just find out some stuff about the fascinating way that that happened. She also has the spa at Leaper's Fork. And I have been there. And let me tell you, it is fantastic. If you live in the Franklin area, or not Franklin, Nashville, anywhere, head over to the spot, Leaper's Fork. Uh, massage, I got my nails done, got all kinds of great things. So thank you so much for being here. And, and we, who is our sponsor? Oh, that's for this right. One. Thank you, Miss Colleen. I don't want to forget our sponsor. It is Sunita Skin Care. So thank you so much for sponsoring this panel. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Sunita Skin Care. And we're going to get to Lisa being the CEO of that in a minute. But, you know, it is rare that we get three amazing boss ladies on a platform, on a couch, who have stories of how they reached the pinnacle of what they were doing. And we have so many women in this audience that at this stage of their life don't feel visible in the business world anymore, whether it's in their company, whether they're dying to try something new, but they're like, I don't have the experience. I've been doing you know, this for so long, this won't translate into something else. So what would you say, and I'm gonna start with Pat, that would change the mindset for women in our demographic to say, no, it's okay. You, know, you are not invisible. What would you say to them to change their mindset? Um, well, thank you for the question, and thank you for letting us be here today. This is great. So um, I'm 64, and I, I understand the idea. I used to walk into a room, and especially the men, because I was hot, would turn around, and, and today I could walk into a room and know it, you know, they'll like say, excuse me, but do you know where the coffee is? So it, it changes when we get a little older. But I think the idea that we're invisible is a superpower. It really is something that I claim because I think women get a lot of attention when we're younger for the wrong reasons. And when we really have the brilliance, we're more ignored. But when you are maybe not the center of attention, you can see and hear things and be part of everything without anyone else even seeing your presence. And then you gain so much knowledge and so much wisdom. But then I think psychologically, you change it in your mind to not be invisible, but be in charge. And when you speak, right, thank you. And when you speak, take the room. Because when people are witnessing another human being, they're mostly thinking of themselves anyways. They're really not thinking of you. They might be giving you attention, but it's usually attention about what they want from you. So my, my whole belief is claim, claim the invisibility, claim what you can gain from it, and then claim your space. Love this that. is really a good time yes. for us. We're brilliant. Love that. That's hard to follow up, Mila. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> no. How to change the mindset like at this point in their lives, maybe they're not as visible in their career, or they want to try something new, but feel like their experience isn't going to allow them to try that. Like, I don't have, I, you know, I did this for so long. How is that going to be a value to something else? Yeah, I mean, I go back to, I've lived some trials. I feel like we probably all have some fiery trials where we sometimes still feel like we're smoking, even a few years later. Anyone feel that way ever? Yeah. <laughs> 
So I think f for me, walking through trials um, has taught me more about purpose than it has anything. You know, when I started the company, I knew nothing uh, at all. And working with female executives today at all levels of the spectrum, getting ready to retire, getting ready to go in, um, getting ready to change, I think for me it comes back down to we all have a gifting that nobody else has. So each one of us does something better than anybody else. You were created for a purpose and a deep purpose. And so many times I find women, including myself, going, eh, I don't think I can do that. I'm so fearful. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough experience. And I think it's just that one step after the other. But the piece of it that I've always held on to for myself and for other women is you have a purpose. And we often forget that. And it has nothing to do with what you've learned even sometimes. You're like, this is just a new thing that I want to try because this is actually the very thing that I was created for. So finding that gifting is more important than anything else. What do you do better than everyone else? And my kids will tell you I do one thing better than anyone else, and that's it. And the rest, they're like, hmm, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. But this one thing you do better, and I think as you put one foot in front of the other in fear, and I think the last thing I'll leave you with, the biggest, the biggest thing that I've learned from mentors in my life has been you do not want to look back with regret and not get to the purpose that you were set for. So find that gifting, hone the gifting, build the gifting, share it, and no one's looking at you, to Pat's point. No one's looking. They're not. No one cares. They're all about themselves. This world is very selfish, right? So if you're making mistakes, people are like, hmm, and they're moving on. They don't know. So find the purpose, find the gifting. That would be where I'd leave you. Thank you. That's great. What about you, Lisa? Well, um... For me, I think uh, what I've experienced a lot, and we employ a lot of women, like most of the people that work for me, all my executives are women, and a lot of them are, most of them are over the age of 45. And I think um, in my experience too, I've had to do this myself, it's super important to make sure that um, you keep your skills set up. So I'll give you an example. Um, the vice president that runs my social media keeps on me, getting on me about, you don't know what I'm doing because you don't know how to do it. And so I think, um, don't be afraid to step into learning something new because the world is constantly changing and it's changing so fast now, right? I mean, so I had no idea what she was talking about and, um, but I learned because I had to. And uh, I think it's just really important to for Mila's point, not to be afraid to learn something new and to kind of meet people where they are and not expect them to meet, come to you. And so um, that would be my advice. That's, that's great. And I would say also, one time we had an interview where the word mentor, everyone thinks that a mentor has to be older, but they don't. Mentors can be younger people. If you are in a business and you do not understand the internet, you do not understand how this works, your mentor can be your 25-year-old child, you're someone who works in your office, don't have the mindset that you have to be the mentor or that they have to be older. Right. I believe he said he was a, uh, instead of an intern, he was a mentor oh, because yeah. he was interning, but he was mentoring the younger one that had experience in what he needed to learn, but he was also the mentor with the wisdom of the age, so it was great. Well, so I want to ask Pat a question. So, Pat, you have a passion for helping others. And I want to know, how do you empower people to give back to the community? Okay, ladies, this is really important. I spent 20 years in, for, in nonprofit, and I've probably raised $60 million. So I watched a lot of charity. How many of you believe the statement, those who give, receive? Okay. That is an absolute truth that we ignore on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I am inviting you to adopt giving and receiving as a wellness practice. Every day when you wake up, I want you to think, who can I give to today and what can I be open to receiving? Giving and receiving is a natural process. When you're a baby, someone takes care of you. When you are my mother, 96, I take care of her. We're born to give and receive, but society teaches us somewhere along the line that giving is something we're obliged to do and receiving is something we shouldn't expect. But I'm telling you, giving and receiving are the same thing. 
opposite ends, the yin and the yang, and the more you give, the more you get back. And you give what you are good at, your gifts. Um, so I, I just beg you, think about waking up in the morning and asking yourself, how can you give and receive actively? And when you get in bed at night, count the times. There was a, a preacher in Memphis that I got to hear, and he said the worst thing that could happen to him was to show up at the pearly gates and have to explain why he brought back the gifts he was given to give. So we have gifts. Die empty. Do everything you can do to open your heart and look for opportunities. Small ones, big ones. Say hi to the woman at Kroger and use her name. Make eye contact to the cab driver. Pay for your nephew's college graduation. But look for ways to give. And then receive and receive and receive. And women are not good at that. But every time you give, you make room. And giving and receiving is a natural process. And I swear to you, what you give, you will get back. That, so that true. was great. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, especially when you were talking about how we we don't expect to receive. And I know women our age, that is such it's very we uncomfortable. Give it, you know, or we not put ourselves first, but it is important to give. And I love when you said my nephew's um college. There's my nephew over there. He was right on me, <laughs> filming right when he said, I was like, oh no. Well, and I don't want people to think the gifts have to be big. The That's other day right. I was on the elevator with an, a gentleman going up to see my mom. And I, you know, I just opened my heart to him because he was like a hundred years old. And I said, hello, how are you today? And he looked at me and he said, I'm great, but whoever you're going to see, you are going to make so happy. I was carrying my mom's groceries and her flowers. And he walked off the elevator, and I kind of caught up to him, and I said, I'm sorry, sir, I hope you don't think I'm following you. And he said, you know, this happens every time I meet a pretty woman. <laughs> but when I got to my mom's, I realized he saw me in what I was doing for my mother. He called me pretty, and he made me laugh. And that was only because I opened my heart to him and greeted him with sort of affection. So it's so simple. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's true. So... <laughs> Lisa, you have had quite a story in your life as well. And you took a company when you were in your 40s, right? 40s, and created Sinita Skincare, which is a phenomenal brand. But you weren't in the skincare industry for most of your life. So for the women who are like, I want to pivot, I want to do something different, but I don't have experience, what would you say to them? Well, the first thing I would say is don't let anybody tell you you can't. Um, and I had a lot of people telling me that I couldn't. So um, I started my career in finance and accounting and um, was working on financial modeling and was made a partner in the firm when I was in my 20s. Um, but in the middle of that, my, my uh, son became very ill and subsequently we wound up losing him to cancer. And so... After that, I just thought, I, I need something different. And so I went on to um, start my own accounting and business management firm, which then um, led me to uh, working with companies and helping them turn around. And Sanitas, as it existed, was a very small company in Boulder, Colorado, and they came to help me turn them around. I didn't listen to a thing I said. Wound up owing me a lot of money and um, asked me if I'd take the company in exchange. And at first I thought, no, and I knew nothing about, God, I was using Pond's cold cream. <laughs> so I'm not kidding. And um, I said, no, 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 no. And then they encouraged me to try, there were only three or four products, to try the product for a, a month or so, and I did. And I just, I don't know, I thought, I think I can do this. And it was awful, it was bankrupt on paper, um, gosh, they owed the IRS a quarter of a million dollars. And you don't mess with payroll taxes, by the way. Um, but I just kind of, I had a wonderful team that was there already, and they helped me. And kind of slowly, over time, um, just redid the company and reinvested the profits and grew it organically. It's taken a long time. That was 20 years ago, by the way. Um, 
And yes, I was, I was 41 when I, when I took this on. But I, I would say, so many people said, after it finally became successful, well, I knew you would be good at the, at the accounting, but I didn't think you knew a damn thing about marketing or, you know, or, and I didn't know how to make products. And, and by the way, we formulate and manufacture all of them ourselves. So, I mean, uh, again, learning new skills, which is kind of why I said that to start with was so important to me because I was 41. And if, you know, I have chemists, and if they tell me something, you know, I need to know that what they're saying is, is accurate. So, um, big learning, and um, uh, again, just um, taking it one day at a time and, and believing in myself, because no one else did. No one thought I could do it. So, everyone from my husband to my mom. Yeah. So, listen to what, listen to your instincts. Listen to your gut. You know you have brain cells in your gut. Listen to that. It'll take you a long way. Yeah, it, that, that is amazing. <laughs> that, that story is amazing, That how you just turn that around. I, I just find that great and just a perfect example for women that they can do this. Yeah. I, I made it sound easier than it actually was. <laughs> but but <laughs> you, you, you just held fast and stuck to it. So that's, that is so amazing. And Mila, you know, like we had met, and you've written a book, and you're very open about what happened and the adversity that happened with you, yet you still, you forged ahead, you went on with your business, and how can you motivate other people? to? How do you use your story to inspire others to go with what they have and to become a success? Yeah, I mean, so really quick story. Um, to 2009, I have four stepkids and one on the way, and we get a call from the U.S. attorney in Tennessee. We, not me, he, my husband, who is still alive and we are still married by the grace of God. I haven't killed him yet. <laughs> we get a call from the U.S. attorney, and he ends up going to, uh, well, we, Ponzi scheme, $6 million. And in... 2009, he's sentenced to prison for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Very fun time. And I'm six months pregnant. I drop him off in Atlanta. It looks like Castle Gray Skull from that He-Man She-Ra cartoon, if you ever saw that. It looks a little bit like the prison, you know, in San Francisco. I mean, it is something else. Anyway, long story short, five years later, um, he comes home. But in the meantime, the judge vacates her sentence, resentenced him, and she's a hero of mine as well right here in Nashville, federal judge. But... In the meantime, I'm, I, have a, I have a business, but it's not what it is today. And I'm trying to build my personal brand, and that's what I'm doing for other people. And so you have a community of people who are going, what in the world? Because you can imagine, everybody knows. It's in every paper. It's on the TV. And I'm going, okay, well, I have a choice. Either I can curl up in a ball and cry every day, which I did a couple of times for sure. Um, or I can, I can remember who I am. And that regardless of what my husband does, um, I have a purpose in this life. And I was created for one. And I was not about to let that get me down. And then people, like this woman sitting to my right, which I won't look at her because every time I do, I cry when I tell this story. Um, she, humble is Pat, but one of the most powerful, amazing women you'll ever meet and a business leader in this city times a million. So. People like Pat, I was blessed to have um, come up under me and lift me and help to build my brand and to encourage. You know, she said, if I judged every friend by what their husbands did, I would have no friends. <laughs> and I put that in the book and I even wrote, thank you, Pache, because everybody needed to know who that quote was from. So I would say, you know, it's been since 2009 to now, you know, the company's grown exponentially and I started off in closets and now I do, you know, personal branding for people and corporations. And I never would have thought that that would be how that went. Um, I would have said, you're crazy. So I would say, you know, knowing who you are matters. You know, I thought, knowing that you have a purpose and I am very faith ground, I'm very grounded in my faith. Uh, so knowing that, um, every day I get up and I'm like, Lord, what is your will for me today? And I only fall as far as um, my faith lets me fall, right? Like I know that no matter what happens or what hits me, um, my grandfather used to say when I was uh, younger, I was like sixth, seventh grade, I'd come home and my grandfather would be like, why you have bad day? If you've seen my big fat Greek wedding, that's my life. <laughs> 
That's why I'm in counseling. <laughs> um, more than prison time, anyway. <laughs> Then I'd be like, I had a bad day, whatever, and he would say, listen, bad day, running up hills, Nazis shooting at you in the snow, this bad day. And then he'd look at me and go, and I got shot in leg, I still ran six mile. And then for dramatic, he'd look at me and go, poof, and he'd walk out the door. And I'd be like, yeah, I get it, I get it. So I think just knowing who I am, where I came from, the family that the Lord put me in, you know, I often say, look, there, I don't see any Nazis, we're not in the snow, no one's shooting at me. But really remembering who you are. You know, I had a whole community saying like, oh my gosh, can you believe that your husband did this? And I'm like, no, I can believe it. Every Saturday I drive to Atlanta Federal Prison, I can believe it because I'm seeing it. Um, you know, and then working on your marriage, working on your career. So really knowing who you are and the, and the purpose that you've been given. I keep going back to that because that matters more than anything. It allows you to stay on your path, clearly look at your purpose and know that no matter what happens, um, I have one and nobody is going to take that away from me. And by God, when I die, I will say all of my, all of my gifting has been poured out, uh, and I will have you know, no regrets there. But that fear is hard, so knowing who you are, even when people are like, ooh, can't believe you did that. I'm like, yeah, I get it. But one day you'll get to know me, and hopefully 10 years later you'll apologize, and it'll be fine. We'll be good. <laughs> we'll get some coffee together. You'll hopefully I answer the it. question. No, you did, and you, you did. get over it. You did, yeah. A story to get like that and to get the laughter that we got from the story, that is amazing. Someone that can do that, pull that all together, that is amazing. You know, one of the things you said that I would love to just note on is the fact that Pat was there for you. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of women in our demographic need that connection, need that community of other women saying, you know, we'll bury the bodies. Don't worry about it. Right. They'll never find them. How important has that been in business for you? Like, I would ask, Pat, you're always the supporter, you know? But you get supported, too, and you get... But your intentions now, like when maybe when you were working a little longer before, were, let me get supported. But now you're the supporter. How has that changed? Well, I think I've always been both. And, and again, it goes back to the giving and receiving. Be what you want to get back. So if you want support, be supportive. If you want love, be love. And I don't think it has to do with age. I needed to be... Mila didn't tell the first part of the story. I was running the YWCA, and she was helping me clothe domestic violence victims for years. And so when my great girlfriend told me about this personal dilemma, of course I'm there for her because she'd been there for me. I think it's so important that we women, and it goes back to our purpose... We give out what we want to get back. That is the way it works. Lisa, what would you say? You, had, you didn't have the same support because your mother didn't even support the decisions that you were making. But did you have a team that was there? And are you now, what are your intentions now? Is it to give back to other women in business? What are you doing now that you have the ability to give back? Well, I actually did have um, very strong female mentors. And uh, my first boss, who still lives down the street from me, um, she's in her 80s now, and she's still working for a hedge fund. I mean, she's amazing. She's incredible. But she took a very young girl right out of college who didn't know anything and really mentored me and made me feel strong and, and was a great leader for me. So, yes, I feel... Um, a very huge obligation to make sure that, that I am mentoring young women, middle-aged women, anyone that I can, and I make sure that I give them constant opportunities in my companies, and uh, that's just important to me. It's important to me that I give back what was given to me, so to Pat's well, point. Well, can I say one thing about, so we're in a group together of 15 CEOs, and when women say, oh my gosh, you won't believe what happened to me, before they can get their story out, she has sent them a gift basket. They're, I mean, this woman is one of the most giving women I know, and it's love. She gives out love as freely as most of us give out oxygen. And I would say, when you check the gift bags, you will understand <laughs> how giving she really is. She is, yes. <laughs> So I think we have, I'm checking with Karen, but I think we have time for a question or two. Great. So um, raise your hand. Short questions, guys, please. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Because I can talk forever. That's not a problem. 
Okay, good. All right. Okay. So, oh, oh, you do. Go ahead. That's a mouthful. That's a good question. In one <laughs> sentence, can you state your purpose? I would say to be the best human being I can be and to every day try to care for humanity in the ways that I've been given gifts. That was great. How about that you, Mila? <laughs> I would say um, to help people find their purpose and to be seen um, and to share the love of Jesus Christ along the way. Yeah. I would say just to get up every day and try to be better and to try to make those around me better. That's important to me. I have a whole thing about never looking back and never regretting mistakes because you can't change it. So mm -hmm. just to wake up every day and look forward to what's to come, not, not whatever I screwed up yesterday. <laughs> Any other questions? Wait, we've got somebody back here. Uh, but is there anything, and I'm sure there is, for each of you that you just thoroughly regret and you wish you could that change, but maybe it pushed you forward? Regrets. And what happened that with those regrets? Forward. I'll start with Lisa. Oh, I she was going to look at me. Um, Bridget? <laughs> Let's start with Bridget. We don't have enough time. <laughs> I say I, I, I really try not to do that. Yeah. I try not to have mm -hmm. regrets. So I, I probably have a lot of them, but I push them back and I keep going. Ela? Yeah, zero. Um, because I can see now why, how each thing that I did has played such a role in where I am now. So all the things that I've done wrong, I'm like, oh, Lord, that was terrible. However, you know, being able to see years forward, what that has allowed me to share. We go through trials and we make mistakes so that we can learn and help others uh, with those and hopefully stop them from doing the same thing. So, yeah, I'd have to say zero for now. And I would say I think regret and worry are a waste of time, and I wish I knew that 20 years ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. That was great. Thank one. you so much. Oh, we got one more question. Mindy. Yes. Mindy. What are you looking forward to now, Pat? I am having a ball right here, right now. <laughs> so be present yes. in a moment. Oh, totally. If you're not present, you miss it all. I mean, there is no future, right, that we can be guaranteed of. And seriously, the energy in this room, this room of, I just feel, it's like we're all at a different, we're elevating at a different level here this morning. I'm just enjoying it. I mean, I would say now between, I have five grandkids and six kids total, one, well, four and one any second. Um, so if my phone goes off, I'm running. No, I'm <laughs> um, but that, yeah, now, like now, don't, don't waste time thinking about that. It's now, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm looking forward to the next chapter and whatever mm -hmm. that brings. So maybe running a nonprofit, I don't know. That's but, what I'm looking forward to. Lisa, what I would say to that is that a lot of women don't feel like they have anything to look forward to. It's true. A lot of women are looking in the past and saying the best years were when I was, I had my kids at home. The best years was when I was working full time. What would you say to someone who's so in the rear view mirror to shift it so that they have something to look forward to going forward? I would say that we're not given anything, right? Like, we're, we're not given tomorrow. And there's so much out there that you can do and learn and grow from. And I think it's important for women to keep that in mind. Like, we all have something to contribute and to give. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm running a skincare company now. And I have a little bit of an uneasy relationship with that because I don't really care what people look like. But my true passion is in the nonprofit. <laughs> I don't. I think everybody's, be, I mean, really. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we all have something to give. You just need to figure out what that is. Just take a baby step. It does not have baby to be. Because a lot of women think, okay, you are three CEOs. And I work nine to five. I love my job. But I want to do something else. And maybe it's not take over a corporation. Yeah. 
they are so self-conscious about that when it's okay to say that. Do you want to take a dance class? Do you want to start to exercise? Do you want to read a book on the couch and not feel guilty because the kids aren't running around anymore. They're using your credit card to buy stuff some other room. <laughs> and it's okay to take your self-care for yourself. And I think it's really hard in our generation to put ourselves first because we have been taught by other people that it's selfish. Self-care is selfish. So look forward to... Thank you. <laughs> I have my timer in the back. Um, <laughs> It's okay to look forward to something small. It does not have to be huge. And with that, before we finish up, I just want to remind everybody, we have some incredible shopping out there. And check out all the companies, all the brands. This outfit that I have on was styled by Katie Rushton, who's going to be coming up on our final panel. And thank you. And she, we did an IG Live. We went to Monkeys, which is the clothing store that's outside. I go in sweats and a t-shirt. I'm not, Bridget's the dress. I did not recognize her when I walked in. Yeah. I was like, Colleen. If there's not sneakers, I mean, so look good. at these. Seriously, look people. look so good. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. oh, okay. But just let me finish you know, the monkeys. <laughs> um, so she styled me from head to toe, and she listened to what I liked. These are elastic. I don't like buttons. Don't make me, you know, if I want to have that dessert, I'm having it, people. So check out Monkeys. They have great styles. They have stuff for women to feel comfortable yet stylish. And thank you. And um, Katie will be on our panel, the fourth panel. What was the question, Karen? You said someone had a question. I had a question about what's your advice for taking next steps career-wise? Will you then stay at home on for a lot of years? Just children are now out of the house, and you think, well, maybe. So, I, hey, there's a whole world out there, but. Yeah, you tell them. That's a great question. A stay at home mom that wants to kind of re enter the career. Uh, so, first, I would tell you to take an inventory of what you do well and what you enjoy. And when you know what you do well, it's usually what you do very easily. And we underestimate it. You know, we think, oh, well, that's not a big deal because I do it so well. But that's really your gift. So what you do well and what you enjoy doing. And then look for careers or jobs that will uh, embrace those gifts and talents. Because you don't want to spend eight hours a day doing things you don't like. And I learned early in my career, I could become good at a lot of stuff that I hated doing. And that seems crazy. Mm -hmm. But I did it for years. No more. <laughs> Yeah, I would say then um, ask a lot of people what they do and how they got there and what they're doing now. Um, ask as many people as you can all the time in the store, at church, on the street, in Starbucks. Uh, be, because that door will just open. Then I would say, uh, depending upon what you want to do, go heavy on LinkedIn. Start building a profile. Go super, super heavy. Uh, Co-brand with people and go to networking groups in town, depending upon what you want to do. Chamber women's chamber business events. Cable's a great group in town. Just networking groups for women, um, as they're the ones who will lift and guide, I think, much more quickly and understand. Yeah. What do you call it, Cam? And there's Cable. also yeah. there's also the first page of your books, your planners, has the websites for the women up here. There's Instagram your follows. It's in your Follow notebook. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? I always tell them it's their notebook. It's, it's the notebook. notebook. Yes. <laughs> Not to be confused with the playbill. <laughs> Um, so check that out. There's information there. And is there a question over here? Yes, go ahead. Perseverance versus talent. Which is more important? Great question. Perseverance, Lisa, versus talent. Mm -hmm. For me, it's perseverance. Because um, you can hire a lot of talent, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily hardworking. It doesn't mean they like what they're doing. And what I've found is if you hire someone who does have perseverance and wants to work hard and is, a, is just a great team player, you can teach them skills. And not everybody may have the time to teach, but I'm in a fortunate position where we can. And that's really paid off for, for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time. 
every time, perseverance. Uh, I meet a lot of very smart people. That's why I do what I do, helping people to find where they're going, right? So I meet a, very, a ton of smart people who have a ton of talent who aren't seen and are right here because they just don't work very hard. They don't persevere to the next thing. And I'm like, gosh, you could have been the CEO, but mm, not so hardworking, right? Um, but then, then I meet a lot of people who don't know, didn't really know the, the tactical pieces that, I mean, truth, you can teach anyone to do anything who persevere and they're at the top and they should be. So every time perseverance, hard work, yeah. And that leads me to one other question. When we were talking, um, Mila was on the podcast, we did an interview, it was really interesting, highly recommend it. Um, just say, but we talked about the fact that men never have a problem walking into a room and tooting their own horn. I did this, I did that. Women walk in and they feel uncomfortable with their achievements and they expect people to be a mind reader and just know. Can you talk about your answer to that? Because we were like, how are women comfortable showcasing their talent and what they've achieved, the awards they've achieved, the status? Yeah, I don't remember what I said, so this might it not be as It was brilliant. Good. It was. Great. I do remember you saying, I've never heard a man say, don't toot your own horn. To, you know, yeah. I've never heard anyone tell a man that. Yeah, I mean, part of the thing we talk about a lot is storytelling. So men are just, yeah, I'm the best. And you're like, I'm sure you are, right, as they walk in the room. And for us, it's more like, how do you tell a story and weave it in and then be confident enough to share it? So become a storyteller. But I think the biggest thing working with women has been nobody practices their stories and you haven't written them down. Right? Men are like, I know what I've done, and I know what my golf score is, and, and you're like, great, thanks for sharing. You know, for us, it's more, we don't take the time to do it. Like, what are your stories? What have you done well? Again, that goes back to that gifting and lifts your gifting up, and then find a way to share it in a very natural, non-salesy, cheesy way into conversations that you need to share it with. And then if you're in business, get on LinkedIn, share them there, co-brand with other people. Like, I borrowed Pat's brand. I mean, let's just be real. I borrowed her brand and the strength of who she is years and her brand because I co-branded with it was here and she's lifted mine so I was able to borrow brand value and equity and lift it and then that allowed me to have more confidence to share so surround yourself birds of a feather surround yourself with those the right people and then learn how to share your story and weave it but first you have to know your story most women I'll be like tell me your story I don't know what it is find your stories know what you do well and then learn the art of storytelling yeah hope that helps a little bit Absolutely. No, that is what you said, by the way. I think, yeah, it is. That's pretty much, that was pretty much and what I mean, you said. All right. You know, I feel like having the three of you up here has just lifted, you know, I feel really lifted <laughs> just right. listening to you. I just feel yes. really lifted. So it's just like, you know, you're three women and you always hear this story and uh, the North Star, the, the booth with the North Star about the cup that said empowered women empower women. And I feel really empowered listening to you three. So thank you so well, much. Well, you guys are such a gift to women in general. So thank, thank you, you for this. Thank you. Thank, please thank the... Yes. <laughs> oh, wait. I, I keep going to end, and there's one more question. Last question. I believe you have... I have I to know. Sick as You know, talking about women going into a room and speaking about themselves, well, women can be brutal. Speaking to each other, you know, and I I can speak to a man a lot easier than I can speak to other women. I mean, why? I, I don't know. Probably I have a lot more common with men. You know, probably because I grew up in Northern Michigan. But, um, like, I have a hard time speaking with other women because I feel like, like, they feel like they don't want to hear of another woman how good they did or you know, and that's how I always feel. Like, I don't know if anybody else ever feels like that. I mean, I've started surrounding myself with more Christian women who I don't really get that anymore. But, so, I don't know if anybody else ever feels like that. I think it's interesting. I know that when Colleen and I started this podcast and we were doing a lot of research, and I remember one, and it's something from, you know, long ago, and I feel like the attitude's changing, but it felt like, Women felt like for a while they had to be in competition with each other. It almost felt like only one could be at the top and there was a finite amount, amount of, of oxygen in a yes. room. Like you had to walk in and there was just a finite amount of oxygen. oxygen. And I have found that 
that is a gift as I get older. I have found that is waning away. I don't know about you or all of you. I really do feel like we're more, I mean, just the people in this room, the people that I've met through this podcast, I really feel like the competition's away, everything. You know, we're there to just support each other. I mean, there's so many women in this room right now I'm looking at that we have helped each other. And I, I do feel like that is another gift with age. And I think we're, if we do that now, we are showing our daughters and our younger women that, that the generosity and the love and the sharing and the mentoring goes, there's no limit to that. And there is, there is an infinite amount of attention or praise for everybody. And right. I think it's, you know, I, I can see, I know what you mean. You know, we've all seen the movie, I bet we've all seen the movie Mean Girls. So we, we, we uh, know how that happens. But I do, you know, and, and you know how to, you get the vibe from people like, huh, you know, maybe I don't want to be around that person more. And that's another thing that right. you can, it's okay to end a relationship. Yes. You know, it's okay to end a friendship if, if it's not If you're serving. in a room full of women that are not supporting you, Go turn around, walk out the room. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the bottom line. That's really the, the bottom line is you have, it's all for you. It's mm -hmm. all up to you. So yeah. having said that, we are going to go and give it a little break. Mm -hmm. Please thank everyone on the stage. And guys, we have iced tea and water in the back. We have the spa room, which if you have not checked out the spa, what are you waiting for? And we will see you in about 15 minutes. So enjoy. Thank yeah. you all so much. Thank and you thank so you much. guys yes. for coming up. And thank you, Sunita Skin Care, for sponsoring this panel.